start by saying is Susan. Uh, had it not been for Susan, and by the way, it's Monday through Friday. I wish I only worked on Wednesday. Uh, uh, weekdays. Weekdays. Uh, I first uh, learned about, and forgive the cough drop, I'm trying to get over a cold. I first learned about Nick through Susan. Uh, I get about 1,500 email a day, and I do, believe it or not, look through all of them. And that one stood out. So we made contact, gave my number. Uh, law enforcement's kind of special to me. I was raised by my grandparents. He was a high sheriff of Sedgwick County. Uh, my daughter is married to a police officer, a, a canine officer. Uh, so I see it from both sides. When I first talked to Nick, I knew he wasn't from Texas. You can just, <laughs> you can just listen to him and tell. But he has a love for Texas, and he has a love for law enforcement and that doing it the right way. Nick and I first got together on Dallas police officers' pay. You know, they kept complaining, we can't keep officers, we can't keep officers. Well, no, not if you don't pay them as much as they can get 10 miles down the road, you'll never keep them. So we were able to do something on that, thanks to Nick and, and all of you and the people that were listening. And then uh, the response times. Um, you know, it's one thing if, uh, you know, somebody turns over your trash can if a police officer doesn't show up for a half hour or 45 minutes it's quite another story when it's a murder scene and the police don't show up for an hour or an hour and 45 minutes it's not because they don't want to it's not because they're not good at their jobs there's not enough of them and you know that's not the police department's fault that's the city father's fault and you know she mentioned just a moment ago one of the most important elections is mayor no kidding. Uh, I mean, Mayor Rawlings, he might as well be in Detroit or Chicago or Los Angeles or San Francisco. This isn't any of those. This is Dallas, Texas, and we want to keep it that way. So Nick and I started up a conversation, and we've been, been doing it because I get a response, and as long as we can get the message out. Uh, the last time I was in Dallas back uh, in the late 90s, we started Amber's Alert when I was at a different radio station. Um, sometimes you can make a difference with a radio. This time we need to make a difference because it's not just about something convenient or something nice to do. It's a matter of life and death. And not just, not just the officers, but possibly civilians as well. So uh, with that in mind, Nick, say hello so they can tell you're not from Dallas. <laughs> Good evening. It's a real privilege for me to be here tonight, and I'm, I'm very much at home among people who love Christ. I, uh, my whole life revolves around the Lord now, and I'm very grateful that he's patient and he calls the broken. And uh, again, it's a wonderful privilege to speak to the things I speak to. Um, a little context, back in August of 2017, I told the city council two things one of which was they no longer had a viable policing function in Dallas, and that was very, very obvious. The second point I made at the time was largely academic, and I spoke of an inverse relationship between stress and performance. At the time, again, it was largely ap uh, academic. At this point in time, it's come to fruition, and uh, it's my contention that the Amber Geiger shooting, part of that, the components there were stress and fatigue. Now, by definition, today, and I told Mr. Roberts this, I work at Central, at the Central substation. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, this past Sunday, after the 7 a.m. detail, there was one officer available to answer calls. One. There were four in detail, two on the Katy bike trail, one at the station, and one officer available. That is obscene. So, very quickly, and I'll hand this back over to Mr. Uh, Roberts, I want to make a point of saying something because my chief, Walton, comes into detail when there's a handful of us, and he smiles and he says, any comments? And no one really has a comment to make because obviously we're closeted in that room. So I, let me make a comment right now to the chief and to the Dallas Police Department command staff. What are you going to say when you have another officer lose his or her life. You know that you're sending us out denuded in numbers, a thousand officers short, and to make that point briefly, 
The city insists we have 3,000 officers. We just had a bid process. There are 1,235 officers available for patrol out of the 3,000. So it begs this question, where are the 1,765 other officers? Do we really intend to police the city of Dallas, 1.4 million people with 1,235 officers? That's where we are. This is not an academic conversation. It's a, it's a conversation that has to do with life and death. It's not my narrative, it's really your narrative. And I'm very grateful that Mr. Roberts just decided to get involved. He's not making any friends doing this, but he knows the value that we place on human life. Obviously, Mayor Rollins does not. And then lastly, my conversation has national implications in that every city in this country run by liberal progressives has done this to the policing function. Uh, amen to that. That's uh, the sounding the alarm. You know, as, uh, as Nick said, decisions have been made uh, based on false and misleading statements. I call it the lamestream media. Uh, you know, I have to go three or four times uh, to the source to try and get the real story. When I first started in this business 27 years ago, you know, I could go to one or two sources and have the truth. You can't do that anymore. Um, you can't disagree anymore. Uh, not involved in identity politics. Now, I don't know if Nick wants to respond to this, but the bottom line is I can only hear Chief Renee Hall tell me so many times, hey, we're operating under Detroit standards. It's okay there. I don't live in Detroit. I live in, I live in Dallas, Texas. You know, Detroit standards don't mean anything to me. You know, today, she said, well, our response times have increased by a couple seconds. <laughs> That's great, Chief. Um, and uh, besides that, you should understand that Houston's having the same kind of problem. Forgive me, I don't care about Houston. I live here. I care about my fellow man. But you're in Dallas, Chief. So when the Chief comes out and says, hey, we're doing the job with what we have, Nick, is that true? <clears throat> I, I want to make a point that the, the city largely today, obviously, we're not getting the job done. Folks, fundamental to doing our jobs as police people in this country, fundamental to that is call answering. That's the most fundamental thing we do. Now, interestingly enough, Councilman Griggs and I communicate she provided Griggs information that was so, so, it was heinous, absolute lies in terms of the response times. When he finally got some more accurate data, he released it. We respond to priority two calls, which are stabbings, assaults, major disturbances. We respond appropriately about 37% of the time, 37% of the time, and yet, Chief Hall's narrative is that we simply need to tweak the system in place. They continue to skirt the, the very real necessity to staff the department adequately. I know that, and I say this in public, that I don't know her. I have no animus for this woman, but she's a shill. She was hired to do the mayor's bidding through Broadnax's office. When she says we're going to staff appropriately, that's a very disingenuous statement when you say money and numbers are out of the conversation. Well, by golly, then how do you staff? If you don't have a market-driven wage, how do you pay? How do you attract applicants? Folks, I, I, I can't begin to emphasize without sounding dramatic. We're not at the precipice. The wheels have come off. I have hundreds of call sheets the first entry reads, call expired, no elements available. To make that point, to drive it home, during the Cabell Street robbery, Chief Hall and Adam Madrano went on radio and said, folks, we had officers available, we simply miscoded that. Well, I went on radio on Mr. Robert's show and said, at this moment, I believe it was 10, 17 p.m., there's the entry, no officers available. So you're either lying or you're that misinformed. In any event, you have care, custody, control of the department. It's upon you to be accurate with the information you disseminate to the public. But let me go on record as telling you everything that comes out of downtown or simply lies, manufactured lies to just 
have the public buy into this need, this psychological need that you're listening to what you need to listen to. Everything is copacetic, you're okay. Well, you're not okay. These problems in Dallas were very synergistic. Every city dependent upon every city in the Metroplex that they do their own policing. Should Dallas fail, and I submit to you today here, we have, every city in the Metroplex will be impacted by the lawlessness that's been allowed to entrench itself within the city limits of Dallas, Texas. That's true, and one thing I think we should remember, Chief Hall, as far as I'm concerned, is an operative of the mayor, as far as information going out to the public. Um, you know, they get their talking points straight, throw the folks a bone, let them wag around that out in the front yard, that'll keep them quiet for another six months. Now's not the time to keep quiet. Now's the time to demand, demand action from the city leaders. It's just like with police officers. Well, we don't know why we can't retain officers. That's because they can drive 15, 20 miles down the road and make another 12 to 15 to 25,000 a year. They have families, they have kids. You know, you know, they didn't sign on pro bono to work for nothing. Uh, so finally, that was changed to some degree. But let's talk about, Chief, we mentioned Chief Hall, the crime reduction, increased recruitment, enhancing officer development, whatever that means, uh, improve organizational effectiveness, uh, and enhance community relations. So far, enhancing community relations has been giving us excuse after excuse after excuse with nothing to back it up. You know, I, I want to make a point. Everything here, these five points have to be subsumed under Sir Robert Peel's nine policing principles. The number nine principle reads this way. You gauge the efficacy of a police department by the absence of crime, not by these five points. So what does she do? She comes out and she tells you how busy we are. She comes out and she tells you we've got a new initiative. We've got 20 officers saturating this area where the person was robbed last week. She tries to wow you with how busy we are, but she cannot provide you results. There are no results to be shared with you at all. And so a sacrosanct principle that most departments say they adhere to when they boast of crime reduction is certainly not the case in Dallas. You know, she can come out, and this bothers me, and I speak to it. Let's have a public, public relations gala, photo op, slices of pizza, cold drinks. Just don't call us when you need us because we're not coming. That's the reality, folks. And for me, personally, again, I'm glad I'm allowed to speak to this. But I get so impassioned when I think of the three. Well, we lost five. Three of them had gear on that night. They were told to take the gear off because they wanted to make a politically correct presentation here. We want you to look benign. They went out and took bullets where the equipment would have saved their lives. And so when I say today the Dallas Police Department command staff has betrayed us, their silence makes them culpable in sending us out in the numbers they send us out in to be mauled and killed. That's not dramatic for me, that's real. Now, I want to make a point very quickly. This body and we today have an opportunity mm -mm. to go into black, brown, and white areas and say, this is why this narrative has to be something you embrace. Because fundamental to living this life is the need for security. And that's what we're talking to. We're talking to a need to be safe. That's what this whole thing is about for me and I believe for everyone here. I'm going to ask Nick to speak to, uh, we talked about increased recruitment, you know, the reality, you know, the hard facts, the numbers, uh, lower salaries, less support. Uh, one fact, Nick, that just blew me away, 35, 35 million dollars from the police department budget goes into non-policing functions. Now, I realize there's got to be peripheral issues. There is for everything we do. But when it comes to policing, certain things have to be done. They must be done. So I want you to speak, if you would, to the increased recruitment, the reality of what's going on, the total number of officers. They keep moving the numbers. They try to make it a, true. They, they, they move the numbers all the way around. 
it's very difficult to debate an issue if the facts keep changing. Well, the, 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 uh, the facts are very fluid. The department is very zealous in uh, maintaining secrecy. No one knows how many offices we have. But, you know, the city's narrative crumbles under the weight of its incoherence. Again, oh, we've got 3,000 officers. The insistent that we have 3,000. Well, why are only 1,235 in the bid process, meaning 1,235 badges in the patrol function? Where are the 1,765? Where? The mayor goes on record as saying, you know what? You guys are being browbeat, about, let me correct myself, pistol whipped for these compensation packages. Well, if we're a thousand officers short and paid about 20%, 15 to 20% less than area cities, where are the monies going, Mayor? Because Councilman Scott Griggs admitted to Mr. Roberts that the water department had a slush fund containing some, some millions of dollars. Now, I go on record and I say this, I believe this, I haven't been able to vet it, but you protract that, that argument and the fact is, when the mayor says to the lawsuit that will settle, lot, we could write that check for 240 some odd million bucks, no problem. Well, mayor, how much money are you sitting on? And for what projects when the sanitation department is largely a contracted out phenomenon, you're a thousand cops short, there are no fire, I mean, we're short hundreds of firemen, antiquated equipment, vests that are just as old as can be, where is the money going? Well, I submit to you, and I'll give the mic over, I know that the city is subsidizing the commercial real estate industry. I know that AT&T paid $249 million for their property, and it's on the Dallas County Appraisal District at about $48 million. Folks, I know that Dallas is set up constitutionally as a, a city that, for the most part, they have carte blanche in what they do with your monies. But they have an obligation to provide a policing service that they're not providing. They're simply not providing it. Now, I'll say this because it's so important. Warren versus the District of Columbia establishes that no one has a constitutional right to police protection. But based on the False Claims Act, an action can be brought against the city because the taxes you pay, you have a reasonable legitimate expectation of a police response to your needs. When that response is not forthcoming, the city is in material violation of that statute and other statutes that are similar. You're taking the tax monies and saying, we've got a police department. Well, why in the world is the police department so abysmally run and so dysfunctional? Can I give a, an answer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mayor Rawlings. That's number one. Um, you know, when we talk about enhancing officer development, you know, that's, that's very important because too many times we view police officers as a separate entity from ourselves. They're not. They're men and women with jobs and kids just like the rest of us. Um, so you have to speak to training. Uh, six officers dead in recent years. Five in July 16th, the ambush. You know, I'll, I'll drop this in. David Prince, good friend of mine. I think I introduced you to him as well. He owns Eagle Gun Range. He and I have raised more money for more fallen police officers than I ever have in my 27-year career on TV and radio, ever. Uh, and it just doesn't make any sense. Why does it keep happening? Um, you know, our police department should be as good as anyone else. And to a man and a woman, it is. But are they getting the support, the peripheral things they need to operate in, in the way that they need to operate to keep themselves safe and to keep all of us safe? And I think it's a resounding no, is it not? Yes, sir. Well, we, we have no real support. Um, you know, I made this point, and I know I upset the Dallas Police Department command staff, the, the lieutenants and sergeants, because I, I told them, but for minions like you, the mayor's program could not succeed. We've come to a point in Dallas, Texas, where we're cannibalizing each other now. We, we're, we're watching sergeants micromanage, sit there, watch the computer. One young officer told me this past week, Nick, I answered 11 calls nonstop, drove through McDonald's, got the hamburger, was leaving, and the phone rang. The sergeant wanted to know what he was doing shooting through McDonald's. So they want you to go straight through the shift, nonstop. They want you to be available 
for the late calls. So conceivably, you may work a 10 or 11 hour day with no sustenance, and that's what they want. And in fact, they're disciplining officers for stopping to get something, and they have disciplined officers. And very briefly, I'll touch upon it now before we go on with this new Civilian Review Board. I have a little anecdote there that I'm going to share, and I'll share it now very briefly. There's an officer who spoke to someone who made a complaint. I don't know who that someone is. It ended up before this Civilian Review Board, but here's the gist of it. So the officer speaks to the person and says, let me tell you why what has happened here is illegal. I'll show you the law, the context. So in the aftermath, the person feels that they were spoken to in a condescending manner, that the officer was rude. It goes to internal affairs. They clear the officer. The officer's sergeant says he did nothing wrong. The new civilian review board said, we find his demeanor insulting and rude. So let me say this, and it's for the record. Should this civilian review board do what I suspect it's going to do, it will literally shut down policing in Dallas, Texas. Okay, it will shut it down. And I, I want you to know something. Uh, I've got a couple opportunities to go into South Dallas. I've gotten invitations because my narrative has to be heard by black and brown as well. Um, it's a very difficult narrative to be had. We, we, I have to cite Chief uh, Terrence Cunningham, the chief of the International Police uh, uh, Officers Association back in 2016. We have a lot of dirty laundry, but it doesn't mean you jettison the profession to repair it, to fix it, to speak to it. We need to sit down and have these conversations because as we sit here, I think some people in this room will say, Nick, I can agree with that, that we're losing our culture. We are a people who are in rebellion before a holy God. And if we don't stand and speak collectively, then individually we go home and look in the mirror and, and you have to feel some sense of, I'm not doing my part. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to go into a conversation with a number of people who are Black Lives Matter leaders. These conversations have to be had, and I'm grateful to Mr. Roberts that he has them. And I know he'd engage anyone who calls him, but we have to have these conversations because the slippage in where we are culturally will be materially felt very shortly by everyone in the Metroplex. Yeah, that, she said it earlier, uh, socialism. Socialism's a great idea until you run out of somebody else's money. Uh, bottom line, it's never worked anywhere on this little blue-green marble bouncing around the sun. Never. Uh, we always hear the left say, well, what about Scandinavia? What about it? You want 80% tax rate? I mean, well, I don't want to do a talk show. But the bottom line is exactly what Nick is saying. It's exactly what Nick is saying. The city's budget plan impacts on the police and the fire department. It's been catastrophic. And it's only going to get worse unless the people that are supposed to be served, that are obligated to be served, stand up in support of first responders. Now, you know, as I said before, I have family in law enforcement. You know, my, my daughter, I love her to death, and, and she's got a great husband. He's a police officer. Um, you know, and the, the, the funny thing is, that police dog is totally subservient to her German Shepherd. I don't, I don't get how that works. <laughs> But I see both sides of this. You know, he wants to come home and, and play with my grandkids and cook outside on the weekends. And as Nick will tell you, that, that police family is pretty small. So, you know, he's just like everybody else. You know, to, that's why I took this so personal when Nick first contacted me. I couldn't believe the Dallas I knew and I loved for all those years, even though I'm from OU, uh, you know, the best thing to come I out of I-35 was, well, I won't even go into that. Uh, but the bottom line is, I, I took it very personal. He doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. Nick doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. People get up in the morning, put on the uniform, and go out for people they don't even know. They don't even know, and probably will never meet. The least we can do as a city is stand up, support them financially, support them emotionally, support them in every way we possibly can, 
because if you don't have police, you've got nothing but anarchy. And I don't think any of us want to live there. Um, but if you would, for just a second, talk about this community relations, uh, the whole reality of what that's supposed to be about. Well, you alluding to what the chief is doing. Yeah. With it. You, you know, folks, it, it, in terms of the community outreach, it, it's, and I qualify it, it's my take, it's a, it's a big propaganda effort. Again, we're going to go out, we're going to engage you. And the principal psychodynamic at work here is that you're going to, you're going to believe what you prefer to be true. You need to believe that you're going to be safe, that the police are, in fact, doing their jobs. We have your back. So when they have these functions, that psychodynamic kicks in, their smiles, photographs, slices of pizza, cold drinks. The reality is, obviously, that we're not getting the job done. You know, I, I got asked this morning, or pardon me, this afternoon, I spoke at the Dallas uh, Sigma Chi, and they, the guy says, how do you speak? Don't they want to fire you or hang you out to dry? And the fact is, my hedge against vulnerability, number one, I know the Lord given me a mandate, so I'll speak as long as he, uh, he allows me to. Number two, my hedge against vulnerability, I reached out to Mr. Roberts, and I think the public needs to know. And then with me, I'm blessed. I'm 65 years old. I don't need the work. So I'm privileged to be in the position I'm in and speak to these things. But the community outreach is largely, again, propaganda driven by a feel-good message done for public consumption, really at your expense. And I, I, I wish, you don't know how bad, I, I'm not a man with hubris any longer, not after my, my breaking experience at the hands of God, but I wish they'd call me downtown and say, how dare you? Because I would immediately respond, no, no, how dare you? How dare you put us in harm's way in major fashion? How dare you continue to lie to the public and tell them that they can walk their dog at one in the morning and be safe? I'm constantly called and asked questions by people in Deep Ellum, West End, other areas of Dallas. They never see police. I work the M streets. Everyone knows the M streets. On any given day, I'm the only officer available for the M streets. But with my running around the city answering calls, I will not see the M streets at all for days on end. And yet, they continue to insist that everything is copacetic. That's astounding to me. I still haven't made that connection intellectually. Um, I know this, folks. We have no reference points for where we are. We can't harken back and say, well, 30 years ago, we did this when we were in similar circumstances. Never. Never have you seen a concerted effort to undermine policing in a country like you're seeing in America by the liberal progressives. Now, let me say this point, I, I wanna give the mic back. Right now, we're in a policing paradigm that's based on consent within constitutional context. I would argue that we've left constitutional context and we did so a while back. But this is morphing, you know, shortly we'll be in a a new policing paradigm based on coercion. Because now we know, right? Don't we know in our culture that policing by consent doesn't work? It doesn't work any longer in Baltimore. It doesn't work in New York. It doesn't work in Dallas. And so what, what works? Acquiescing works. What is it that you want? We're going to give it to you. You want that officer disciplined? By golly, we'll discipline him. What is it that you want? because we're going to give it to you in the name of liberty, but it's not liberty, it's license. Liberty has context, license doesn't. License is chaos, and that's where we're heading. I wanna to get to, uh, you know, it's sort of like talk radio. A lot of people that uh, are critical will call up and say, well, you enjoy talking about this. Hey, I'd, I'd enjoy talking about a lot of things that were uplifting, if I could find them. Uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to something like this, you've got to come up with solutions, or at least a plan, a strategy, a direction, something. And no, I can't think of a better person to talk to about that than Nick. I, I want to talk about that, and then I want to talk about, Nick, a call to action. You know, it's, it's one thing to sit here and talk about all this, or go in and do a three-hour radio show every day, but it's something else. If you can take something away, if you can take something out of this room and onto the street and into your homes that you can actually be a part of, you can do something. 
uh, instead of just waiting to react to what happens next. You know, I'll tell a quick story. I got a call from my daughter. Oh, she was boo-hooing, and oh, Dad, it's Lance. And I thought for a minute, you know, there something bad had happened. And I said, well, what happened? Well, he was called a man with a gun call, and he was in the car. The guy ran in front of the car with the gun in his hand. So he had to take chase. He didn't wait for his backup. Well, then they got in a fight. Long story short, he was fine. And she goes, he can't be doing this. My daughter, this is his wife. He can't be doing that. He has to wait for backup. No, sweetheart, if the guy's there with the gun, anybody could have been hurt. You knew what you signed on for. Um, and she didn't want to hear that. Dad, thanks a lot. So you know, she wanted me to take her side. Well, what we need is to take the side of law enforcement in this city. We need to have that same type of commitment, that same type of backup where we care about what's going on. As a matter of fact, 30 minutes ago, I stopped, had to get some cough drops. I've been fighting this chest cold. And I was in 7-Eleven. There was a police officer there and he was getting all his stuff and he had some drinks and some food, got a radio call, boom, he was gone. He probably won't eat again tonight. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we need to be concerned about. Is the mayor telling you the truth? Is the, is the, the chief simply a liaison for the mayor to give us, you know, as I said, a bone out in the front yard to wag around to keep us quiet? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a dog. I, I want to be a resident of what I consider to be one of the finest cities in America, and you can't have that without law enforcement. So let's talk about some solutions and then what everyone can take out of this room. You know, folks, by, by way of solutions, I, I would say this to start. What we want to become is very item specific. You know, the city always gears up for some of these rallies. They know there are three or 4,000 people coming downtown. They've marshaled their resources. They're going to have cathartic moment is what it amounts to. And they go home and the city doesn't have to worry about it anymore because people are spent. But should we begin to go downtown in numbers with an agenda and we are very item specific, we're not moving until that item is addressed and resolved. That's number one. Number two, I would submit to you we begin to reach out to the mayors and city council members and police chiefs in contiguous cities. Ask them what their concern is right now as Dallas implodes. They ought to be concerned there, certainly so, because a couple of weeks ago we had a gentleman from University Park who went home and was followed home and shot twice in the chest with a gun that had been stolen in a burglary in Dallas, Texas. So we're seeing these things happen. Um, you know, one of the things I talked to Mr. Roberts about is we're so far removed from a viable damage control point in terms of hiring what we need to do and this is an idea i believe it works mm -mm. if we hired 200 people tomorrow you put them through a one-year academy an eight-month training program they're not usable or they're not there to do anything for a year and a half what i believe needs to happen is we need to hire people expedite the vetting process you expedite the licensing uh, dynamic through t -Cleos. you have these people licensed, they go through a very intensive one-year on-the-job training program with a veteran officer in the squad car. They don't get in the car unless they're with a veteran, but that's the only way I see you putting two, three, four hundred officers back in patrol within a very reasonable amount of time. It's outside the box. But I submit to you that, I forget who said it, he said ours is a system of proximate solutions to insoluble problems, and we run the gamut. We have to come out of the box if we're gonna address this. We don't have any more orthodox solutions. We have to gauge what works, forget about the special interest or what's politically correct, or you know, Chief, I know you've done it that way forever. It doesn't work, but because it's a custom, we adhere to it, no, we jettison that. We really need to push and say, we're not going to just talk about it. We need this done now. I'm just really grateful that I'm up here and I'm not discussing this in the aftermath of having lost a colleague. Because I want the city to know you're culpable for that. That's on your hands now. And I want to say this about Amber Geiger. Mayor, this is your job. This is your doing. You said it only took a warm body to do this job. That girl's not a, a warm body. She made a mistake, a horrible mistake, but the atmosphere she made it in is of your doing. 
I want to establish that. I want to go on record with that. And I want to say this to the Dallas Police Department command staff. You knowingly and willfully send us out in denuded numbers to be more than killed. And then you have the audacity to cite the oath we took. We didn't take that oath in a vacuum. We took that oath before God and man. I didn't take it before the city of Dallas to lie and defend a department that, that is indefensible. It's so important to me, if I do nothing else before a holy God, I want to establish culpability. When this thing goes south, and it will, I want people to know they no longer have the luxury of saying, well, I didn't know. Well, you did know. You made a choice to do nothing.